Hi, Fast Fan. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd serve Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their build, and support both production and post-production. I've got some great stories to tell, and that's why I created this channel. I hope you like the video. When I was about 13 years old, I started paying closer attention to cars in general as I was getting closer to the legal driving age. Most of my neighbors had generic cars, some had crappy cars, one had an AMC Gremlin, and one had a few nice cars. My parents, of course, had horrible taste in cars. My mom drove a 1979 Chrysler LeBaron station wagon, and my dad had a Datsun A10, but my friend's mom had a 1979 Buick Regal. This was the car that got me to school on days that I didn't skateboard to school. Like most American cars of that era in the 1980s, my neighbor's Regal was a land yacht, but it was certainly better than riding in a station wagon with fake wood siding. The Buick Regal's interior was drab and featured a huge monolithic dashboard and a lame 85 mile an hour speedometer. The seats were huge and then we were wrapped in plush blue velour. This interior reminded me of my grandmother's living room. There was really nothing special about it, but all cars of that era pretty much had the same type of interior. Interior trim pieces in this car were chrome-plated plastic bits with a couple of strips of fake wood trim decals. I mean, we were talking, it was just bad. Riding in it was like riding in a boat, and it, was, it felt like the suspension was made from marshmallows. If you wanted to stop in this car, you better plan well ahead. These were my impressions from my first experience with the Buick Regal. A few years later, I was dating this girl named Debbie. Debbie's dad and I got to talking one day, and I told him that I was into cars. He proceeded to tell me about the cool car he just bought a Buick Regal Grand National. I knew the name Buick Regal, but not the Grand National. I sort of smirked and I softly said, you know, I've been in one of those and I didn't find it really fast or sporty or even sporty looking. He proceeded and went on to tell me the many reasons that his car was special. What he described was mostly interior trim bits. Eventually he told me that this model was faster than that year's Corvette. I immediately called BS. He walked me out to the garage and there it was. Dressed in black, this Regal looked like it belonged to Darth Vader. Being 20 years old and knowing everything, as all of us do at that age, I commented that the car looked cool, but I doubt it was any more impressive than my neighbor's Regal. Stupid comment, I admit it. Hop in, he said, and we drove over to a little section of straight road about a mile away. He did a brake stand, something often referred to back in those days as power braking, to spool up the turbo, and once he lifted his foot off the brake, the thing took off like a bat out of hell. I had, up until that time, I had never been in a car that fast. At the time, the automotive press claimed a 4.8 second zero to 60 time for that car. This number was impressive for the time, but after a few years, the experience faded from my memory, and I forgot all about the Buick Regal Grand National. Fast forward to 1994, and I was at LACR with my supercharged Mustang. This car had a built 347, a Vortec cog drive S-trim supercharger, and had uh, supporting suspension and fuel system mods. It was a legit car. It was 540 horsepower or so. In my third race of the day, a Buick Grand National lined up against me, and I remembered this car. All the memories came wishing back, and I remembered Debbie's dad, Grand National, and I knew that they were quick for their day, but surely a V6 couldn't run with a drag prep supercharged V8, right? Wrong. He ran an 11.5 to my 11.4 and his car looked bone stock. Suffice to say, my first experience with the modified Grand National was very memorable. Over the years, the Grand National has become a legend, building its reputation at Friday night drag races all over the United States of America. The remarkable thing was that this car came from Buick, a company more experienced in building cars for grandparents rather than building sports sedans. Yes, I'm well aware of the GS. Not since the 1960s had Buick built anything even remotely exciting. The first Buick Grand National debuted in 1982 with a wheezy 4.0 liter V6 that made only 125 horsepower. It wasn't until 1984 that the first Grand National to feature the legendary 3.8 liter V6 turbo was released. Over the years though, the Buick Grand National got even better. Here's a quick summary of the history of this car. In 1982, it had the 4.1 liter V6, 125 25 horsepower, no turbo. Going on to 1983, there was no Grand National. Sport model was released and it was called the T-Type. It made 190 horsepower. 
In 1984 and 85, the 3.8 liter turbo V6 was making 200 horsepower in the Grand National. In 1986, the 3.8, same 3.8 V6 turbo was now up to 235 horsepower. In 1987, it was bumped up to 245. But also in 1987, the Buick, re Buick released the GNX model with the same motor, but now tuned by ASC McLaren. Although rated at 276 horsepower, it's really a little over ho uh, 300 horsepower. The GNX's stats were the most impressive of all the Grand Nationals. It did zero to 60 in 4.7 seconds, according to the automotive media. The quarter mile flashed by at 13.5 seconds, which was hugely fast for that time. And in fact, in its final year of production in 1987, the Buick Grand National was faster than a Ferrari F40, a Porsche 930 Turbo, and a Chevrolet Corvette in the quarter mile. That's some serious jobs. This car proved itself over the years at drag strips all over the USA. It was a formidable competitor on the street and out on the track. And when you lined up next to one, you never knew what you were getting. General Motors, however, in their infinite wisdom, killed the Grand National off and brought us a crappy, ugly, poorly built replacement Bu Buick Regal with a wheezy 3.1 liter V6 engine and mounted on a front wheel drive chassis. And that was the end of the Grand National. General Motors did, however, build upon the success of the Grand National a few years later when they introduced the GMC Typhoon SUV and the GMC Cyclone small pickup. Instead of the 3.8, these v vehicles used a 4.3 V6 turbocharged, making 280 horsepower. And you would see these things all over the drag races in the United States. Now, all this background I felt was important for those fans around the world that may have not known the history of this car. In Fast Forward, the Buick Grand National finally got its moment in the spotlight. As the movie opens, Dominic and his crew find themselves in the Dominican Republic. The plot has them hijacking a gasoline truck. Of course, Fast 4 was not filmed in the Dominican Republic, and in fact, this scene was filmed racing along Templin Highway, a winding mountainous road to the north of Los Angeles in the Santa Clarita Valley. Templin Highway connects Interstate 5 with the north end of Castaic Lake, a few miles north of Castaic. How do I know this? Because I grew up in this area and used to drive on this road often. In fact, there was hardly any ever cops up there. In the scene though, Dom and Letty are leading the crew during an attempt to dislodge some of the trailers from the back of this trailer train. I've never seen a tractor pulling five trailers anywhere in the world, but the concept has its precedent. That aside, audiences suddenly see Han. Wait, wasn't he killed in Tokyo Drift? Oh yes, he was. But fast forward in the movie timeline is out of sequence. To, as a reminder, to watch the films in their timeline order, it's one, two, four, five, six, three, seven, eight. And so, in this timeline, Han is not dead yet. Of course, he never really died. In any case, this scene opens with the Grand National and fans of his cars went nuts. Of course, this scene required plenty of Hollywood magic and trickery. For starters, you probably guessed that Vin Diesel didn't actually drive these cars in reverse, at least not for long. Driving in reverse at speed is a favorite gag in action films, but it doesn't happen as it is shown in the movies. And in fact, most cars, even today, can barely manage to do 20 miles per hour in reverse. Movie magic is liberally applied here. In this case, in order to pull off the backwards driving scene, Dennis McCarthy and his team built a backwards Buick. Let me explain. Basically, they took a pair of Buick Grand Nationals. One was in 1985, the other one was in 1986, and they put the engines in the trunk and then mounted a dashboard and steering columns right in the back seat where the right rear passenger would be sitting. They had to get a tiny driver, of course, into the back seat in order for this to work. By using this configuration, Dom could be sitting in the front and pretend to turn the steering wheel while in the back seat, there's a little person actually driving the car. <laughs> if you look carefully at this shot, you can see the rear wheels turning instead of the front wheels. Something's gotta be amiss, right? You'll also notice that the camera angles are set up so that you can't see the backseat driver. You can tell from this shot that there's an engine in what is supposed to be the trunk. In total, there were eight cars used. They had two reverse driving cars. Then they had the Hero One car, which was a 1986 Grand National. They had three stunt cars, according to the VIN list. Two of them were 84 Buick Grand Nationals and one was an 86 Grand National, again, according to the VIN list. One of the stunt cars, car number 2.2, is the only one that had a V8 engine. A V8 was used in order to be able to get the car off the line fast enough because the 3.8 had turbo lag and they needed this car to really just jump off the line and they couldn't do it with the original setup. 
The same car had a camera mounted inside the car so that they could show the driver's foot going from the gas pedal to the brake pedal and all that. So it was used for those, those cut in shots. The car on the VIN list labeled WHLE implies that this car was supposed to be a wheelie car. So presumably the wheelie was removed from the script. Otherwise they wouldn't have designated the car that way. The buck car of course is used for green screen shots. And of course we have the two reverse driving cars, both of which still exist. All of the cars had major suspension changes so that they could get a nice low stance. This included Hotchkiss suspension and major changes to the suspension geometry in order to lower the cars about three inches to get that nice ride height. To make sliding the car around easier, Dennis McCarthy and his team added some CNC slide brakes and an extra set of wheelwood calipers to the rear axle. So what happened to these cars after the movie? Like so many others, they most have bounced around between auto collectors and car museums. As of mid-2020, here's the information I have about the whereabouts of these cars. The Hero One car was offered at the Meekum Auto Auction in 2015. Velvet Collection still has one of these cars at their museum in Branson, Missouri. Volo has, or used to have very recently, the stunt car with the V8. The Desert Collection has one of the reverse driving cars at their facility in Orlando, Florida. The second reverse driving car is unaccounted for as of mid-2020 as it has changed hands quite a few times and frankly we just lost track. A private collector, the same guy who owns my Maxima, has the car with the side damage on it. Cinema Vehicle Services still has one of these cars if my information is correct. And the Hollywood Star Cars Museum has one of these at their location in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. These cars would still be collectible even without their movie pedigree, so it's nice to know that these cars still exist. So if you want to see them, you should go to some of those museums I mentioned. The Grand National is still a favorite among Americans who were alive and into cars back in this era. This was Buick's last great hurrah, as the Buick brand has deteriorated into a shadow of its former self. Frankly though, Buick has never produced anything close to the Grand National and probably never will as the world moves towards SUVs and hybrids. Thankfully, Dennis McCarthy and Universal helped give this car its moment in the spotlight and immortalize this legendary car on film. We'll always have that, I suppose. That's going to be it for this time, so thanks for watching. 